stupid chair. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, yesterday, or depending on when you watch this, January 10th, the Oscar nominations were announced. Uh, now, I'm going to do two videos here. Um, the first video is actually because it, it has to be as fresh in my mind as a Les Miserables review. So I'm going to do that first, and then I'm going to talk about my, re my reaction to the uh, Academy Award nominations. But I will dabble into it a little bit here in this review. Um, first of all, I have to say, the whole reason I'm reviewing this movie now is because now is the time. This is what I call my Oscar quest. You know, you could say, you know, it's kind of like The Hobbit. I am planning on seeing as many or all of the Best Picture noms before uh, the ceremony in February. And right now, I am planning on three reviews in the next three days. Today I have Les Mis, tomorrow Lincoln, and possibly Life of Pi on uh, Sunday. But that's, right now it's, not everything's uh, set in stone. So that might not come until, uh, a, you know, I'm definitely going to see it this week. But, uh, but it's not going to be right, it might not be right away. But we'll get into Les Mis here. And remember, th this review is totally unscripted. Um, and if you noticed on my Lord of the Rings reviews, I always put like a hat on or something. Well, let's see here. I can try to think of something. Hang on a second. Nope, didn't think so. <gasps> oh, I can breathe again. Oh, okay. I wonder if that's how the actors on Les Mis felt as well. Oh boy. Okay. Well, that, that was not pleasant. Okay. So, Les Miserables, I am not familiar, or not too familiar, I should say, with the stage musical uh, that's, you know, popular on Broadway, or, you know, travels around the country and all that, nor with the story with it. I'm just, I basically know the, ba the very, very basics. Not too much. Not too much. But, I uh, do know enough about what the characters' names are, you know, and stuff like that. And uh, in case you're wondering, Les Miserables means the miserable, um, or the miserable ones, I should say, in French. But some people argue that it's not the people on screen that are the miserable ones, it's the people in the audience. That sucks. I don't know why. I, I thought it was pretty good. That's just me, though. I'm, I'm sort of a fan of musicals. Like, I love all the old Hollywood, you know, West Side Story, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, all that stuff. I love that stuff. But, uh, and this is a darker tone. One of my favorite movies from 2007 was Sweeney Todd. Uh, and not only because it's Tim Burton, but because it was fantastic. And this kind of reminded me of that a little bit. And not only because it opened on Christmas Day, but because it was a great musical. And it had an all-star cast. <laughs> and funny enough, two of the leading actors from that movie were supporting actors in this one. And we'll get to that soon enough. But man, that, that was fun. I'll, I'll give them, that, them, them props right away. That, that was funny. Okay, so Les Mis, the whole story centers around this convict, or maybe ex-convict, uh, Jean Fergeon, played by Hugh Jackman, who, who did get a Best Actor nomination. Uh, boy, I have not seen enough movies yet that have been nominated for Best Picture and also Best Actor, or just Best Actor, that I can agree with whether or not it was a good nomination. But I have seen a movie called Bernie. Um, it was on Netflix, actually, I saw it. And Jack Black was phenomenal in that. I'm not usually a, uh, a big uh, Jack Black fan, but he blew me away in that movie. He, he could have been nominated. And, and there was a little bit of a, a grounds bowling on the web that people said he should be nominated, but he, he didn't, but that's too bad. Um, if he turns out another performance like that and it gets enough wind you know, behind it, sure, he's got a, he's got a nomination there. But, uh, Hugh Jackman, I thought, did a good job. And his singing voice was fine. There were some spots, especially toward the end of the film, where his singing voice, or the, I should say this, the singing, his part, it almost goes from this kind of mezzo-tenor, if you know what I mean, kind of this mid-range voice, uh, to suddenly it's like almost all into close to high tenor range. Um, where a lot of it's falsetto, it's, a lot of it's got to be falsetto, some stuff in there, kind of like Bee Gees stuff, you know, whatever, you know, almost like a baby crying sometimes. But it wasn't that bad, it wasn't that bad. Uh, anyways, this ex-convict, you know, after an, a small act of kindness, kind of changes his ways completely, and he makes a complete 180 and goes from a thief to pretty much a giver. Um, and he runs a factory, um, actually eight years after this. 
And that's kind of where the central story begins. But before that, we're also introduced to this character named, uh, crap, I can never pronounce it correctly. I think it's uh, Javet, Javet, something like that. It's Russell Crowe, in case you're wondering. And uh, I thought Russell Crowe's performance, just his performance and his facial expression stuff were awesome. Almost to an Oscar level. His singing is the only thing that stopped him from getting it. His singing, I don't think it's bad. This is just my opinion, remember. You're entitled to your own. His singing wasn't bad. It just wasn't up to the level of a few other actors. But I thought what was funny was the first, the first couple of songs he did, I was just like, ugh, two and a half hours of this. This is going to be horrific. But then he did a song called, uh, I actually looked it up, it was called Stars, where he, uh, and in the, his big scene, you know, declares, I'm going to go after Jean Frajon, I'm going to get him, no matter what it costs, no matter how long it takes, I am going to get this man. And I thought that song was actually really, really good. And then the scene where, I, I don't think I'll spoil it, but where his, his last song, I thought that was another good one. But, uh, and then in between, he didn't do too much, so, um... Which is fine, but uh, I thought um, he did good, and Hugh Jackman did fine, so these two lead actors were great. Now now we get into the good stuff here. The supporting actress. Okay, the Oscar, the Oscar nominations, before they came out, everybody was talking about Anne Hathaway. And I have to say, all the buzz was true. She kicked total butt in this movie. And she's only on screen for maybe 20 minutes. 20 minutes, I swear. It was like, uh, ah, just incredible work. In that first act, kind of that segment where it's uh, Jean Frojean after he's kind of had this a little bit of success, she owns that. I mean, literally anybody else, whether it's Russell Crowe, who himself has won an Oscar, or Hugh Jackman, who's got a big career, you know, he's, you know, he's Wolverine for God's sakes. They are jack crap compared to Anne Hathaway because she just steals the whole thing. It's incredible. Uh, and of course, uh, if you know anything about the musical play, you know she's not going to be in through the whole movie. And yes, after her death, it's not like, not to spoil anything, but I think a lot of people know that. It's, it reminded me a little bit of the film, uh, you probably know it, um, Full Metal Jacket by Stanley Kubrick. I'm one of the few people who says, or not one of the few, I should say, but in the minority that says the overall film is hurt drastically by its, uh, its kind of, its two ha its two-parter, you know? The first part at boot camp, seriously, could be a contender, if that was just the whole film, could have been one of the best Vietnam War films we've ever had, and it doesn't have one scene in Vietnam. That, you know, just that stuff with Arlie Ermey and Vincent D'Onofrio, Matthew Medine, and, you know, all these other great actors, um, that it's fantastic. And then after that, the movie just, like, almost, you know, nose dives into pure um, uh, cliches, uh, war movie cliches. Uh, but, uh, but the ending was a little different, and that's kind of what helped it. But uh, overall, I, I still think that film is not one of my favorites from Kubrick. And I know I'm going to get shunned for that, but just because I don't, you know, think that uh, Full Metal Jacket's 100% or uh, an A plus or whatever, I say it's kind of like a B, you know, somewhere in there. But it's and that's because its nosedive is pretty drastic. It hurts the film. Here, though, it's not as crippling, or I should say, is hardly crippling actually. But um, but it is noticeable once she's off screen that it's you know it's not as good. Uh, and when she sings the song I Dreamed a Dream, just personally for me, I felt, I felt a, a die-hard performance here. I felt a performance that was true to, true to God, believable, completely believable. And when she was singing, it was sad to see her that low. It was, it was probably the best acted scene, um, or I should say the best acted musical scene of the year by the time she sung like the third note. It was just incredible. Uh, and literally, if I were to watch the movie over again, I would come in for her whole section, and then maybe a little bit toward the end uh, as well, but definitely her part in this movie is what helps make it uh, a great watch, just all together. Um, let's see. 
after this, I don't know, uh, Amanda Seyfried, we'll get, we'll get to her now. Amanda Seyfried, I saw her in a movie called Mamma Mia, a lot of you have, by the way. Uh, and she was, she was good in that. Not in Binding is fantastic, and she hasn't really improved. Not to say she's a bad actress, but just uh, her overall role is still kind of it's it's reduced. You know, uh, Cosette after Cosette, you know, and that, that's a good joke by the way in the movie too. Cosette, uh, her role is her, her, almost her child role is has a little bit more screen time and a little more dialogue. Her, uh, you know, like adult, you know, or in this case it'd be teenage role. Um, it's, it's smaller as far as screen time, but it's larger as in plot, as in the whole plot, subplot of this guy named, what was it, Marius or something? Who, by the way, that, that guy, before I get to him, I have to say he can sing. I can give him that. Um, the whole subplot with that, uh, his whole, you know, reason for being in the movie is bigger than anything that she does in the film. And she was, yeah, she was fine. I'll give, I'll give her that. And then uh, the supporting cast, I thought beyond that, the people who don't, you know, whose names don't appear on the poster, um, or most posters, I should say. Uh, I can't remember the guy's last name, but his first name was Eddie Red. I'm gonna try to get his last name, Redemain, something like that, <laughs> more or less. Uh, he did good. I thought he was. I I've, I've never seen him in anything, um, but I thought his singing was very very good. This guy could get on just from a. A, get a good career just based on his singing. Um, and then I thought, uh, this whole there was this whole kind of group of like boy rebels that I thought was, you know, all of them were good young actors. Uh, I have to mention by name, uh, I did figure out her name, Samantha Burks uh, plays, I can't, I can never remember the character's name, nor basically can I pronounce half the names, but um, she was fantastic, she blew me away. Uh, she was fantastic. She had a, she has a great singing voice. She, her acting capabilities are very strong. Uh, if Anne Hathaway would have been her character, Fantine, been played by anybody else, she could have nabbed up and stole this as the best supporting actress in the film. Uh, if you know, if the actress they put in for Anne Hathaway had been you know not as good, but I think that role was written so well that if the actor is up to it. For, it's a for sure, you know, uh, steen, uh, steen, scene stealing uh, performance, and also uh, basically a movie stealing performance just from a couple of uh, scenes or you know about twenty minutes of screen time. So uh, yeah, it's it's really really incredible uh, to see all these different actors doing good stuff. Now we get to Helena Botham Carter and Sasha Baron Cohen were hilarious in this movie. Everything, every time they came on screen, I, I, a smile came on my face. Number one, well, two reasons. Number one, their characters are written as so wacky and offbeat, you can't help but laugh or smile at them. Number two, if you have seen Sweeney Todd, you know why, you know reason number two. They were both in that film, they both did great, uh, they both sing very well, of course, and uh, so seeing them together was a treat, number one, and number two, it was, it was hilarious. It was good stuff, and... I was kind of glad that they had some stuff. They didn't just have one scene, which was good, uh, unlike Anne Hathaway. So, uh, not, you know, literal sense, but, but yeah. <clears throat> okay, now we'll get to... There were a couple of problems with the film. I'll, I'll get into them here. The first problem I think I had was pace. Uh, it's set up so that the film, you know, it has this big introduction scene with Jean Farjan, you know, uh, you know, I have this big, you know, uh, epiphany about uh, my crime life, and I'm going to switch it all around, all that, you know, and that takes about 12 minutes. And then we get, uh, you know, the eight years later, he's the owner of the factory, that takes close to an hour. And then the rest of it, you know, an hour and a half almost, is uh, the whole French Revolution part. And I think that's spaced out about right, but I think the problem is you feel the length of it, and some scenes just don't match up. Like, some scenes and musical numbers just go on and on and on. We don't think, okay, they can't shorten it here. But they're still singing. Why are they still singing? Is that shot been on for two minutes? What is up with this? Stuff like that. Yeah, I did notice that, by the way. And uh, there's an endless parade of close-up shots. I'll, I'll go into more detail on that in a second, but where's I going? Oh, yeah, the pace. Uh, seriously, though, the pace is kind of all over the place, and there's like five different endings where they could have cut the film and just, you know, 
you know, we could have, you know, we had the assumptions right. You know, we didn't have to actually see it. But, uh, <laughs> but still, I, and then I thought the very last ending, which uh, revolves around a character actually f almost physically going to heaven, but not, you know, like going up an escalator or something, was unnecessary and almost completely cheesy. I, I don't know about the actual Broadway production. Maybe it plays better on Broadway, but in film, I felt... I felt it was a cheesy, lackluster way to end the film on an, you know, you know, em emotional note. I thought just the, the fact that this character, whoever he or she is, dies. They could have ended it right there and it would have been maybe better. But, uh, but then again, they want to have that big kind of closing number, too. And, uh, you know, but, but, you know, whatever. Whatever floats your boat. <clears throat> okay, the second one... Uh, a big complaint that I have, it's actually a consistent complaint. Some people say, well, what are you talking about when I say this? There's, an, like I said, an endless parade of close-up shots. That The cinematography, after a while, it almost feels like, literally, they say, okay, we're going to have, we have three different types of shots in these movies. We have close-ups, we have, like, shots of, you know, where the camera stays on a person for literally almost their entire song, or three, we have a shot that's like sideways, and it looks up. You know, like the characters are standing right here, the camera's down here, so it makes it look like they're like six feet taller or something. Or it's like a sideways coming from this way or something. It, it's always so weird. I don't know. It's like the director of cinematography. I can't remember if it got a pick, a, a, a nomination for director uh, for best cinematography at the Oscars. If it did, it was almost undeserved. I have to say, because it was just so unoriginal. It just kept coming up with the same stuff that it's almost the equivalent of, if you actually see the show on Broadway, getting up at certain points, moving to like a different side of a theater, and watching it there, you know, you, you get to see different things, or, you know, you'll still get the same story and stuff, but you just see it from a different angle, and sometimes it affects, you know, you see certain backgrounds better. You see certain, you know, extras better, and maybe some of them have better facials than some of them up front, or something, you know, and it's... It's a different experience, but here it's just, uh, I don't know, it's weird. I didn't like that. And yeah, that's the other thing it runs into. The editing is so monotonously slow, or almost non-existent in some parts. Literally, Jean Farjean's first big song, you know, uh, I, can't, I can hardly remember the, the name, or even you know, if I could find out the names of these songs, uh, without doing a lot of background information into it. Literally, um, I just couldn't figure out um, why they wouldn't cut from him. His first big song where he has, you know, the big realization moment. Um, literally, I think they make three cuts in that song. I, I didn't count them, and I'm not going to go back to the theater just to count the cuts in that song, but I, I, wouldn't, mi I wouldn't mind seeing it again. I'm just going to wait till DVD. Um, definitely, I think that the cutting in the film... There, you know, there are moments, of course, where they do actually edit it well, and it's regular editing. But I think it's just, some of it is like, they ran out of time. So they said, okay, well, we had just, you know, we tried a couple of shots where we didn't cut at all, and we followed them forever. Let's just use those. <laughs> it, it just seemed like that. And the actors are into it. It's not like you can almost see the actor's eyes saying, you know, why isn't Tom calling cut? It was Tom Hooper, the director of this, uh, who directed uh, King's Speech, by the way. And uh, if I, when I talk about my Oscar noms, I might talk a little bit about uh, um, the last couple of years of the Oscars. I don't agree with all the choices that Oscar has made over the last couple of years, especially in 2010 when King's Speech came out. But I still love King's Speech. It was still one of the best films of the year it came out. But, um... Tom, I've always kind of had this reluctance to, since he won Best Director over David Fincher, but that's just me. I'll, I might get more into that later. But yeah, this was a film I thought he did a, an adequate job at. But then again, a lot of people that criticize the film go directly after Tom Hooper. And in fact, I had a friend who saw this over, Chris, uh, over Christmas, like the day after Christmas or something, and he said it's the worst directed film of the year. And he said that the camera literally, he said, he said literally every shot... The camera is in the wrong place. I sometimes I disagree with that. I thought sometimes the cinematography looked great. But another thing, if you know if you know me, I hate shaky cam. You know what that means? You know you can kind of 
It, it kind of does this a little bit, sometimes slower. I absolutely freaking hate that crap. That is ridiculous. Add realism. Bogus. You make people sick. I don't personally get sick from that, but I just find it disorienting sometimes. Not to the point of nausea, but disorienting to the point I'm, where I'm just like in frustration saying, keep the bloody camera straight. But that's just me. That's just me. You can, if you love that stuff, woohoo, go watch Blair's Witch Project for the 500th time. <laughs> that's just me. Um, okay, and the biggest, maybe the biggest problem, but, but, um, the one thing you probably said, why haven't you mentioned this yet? 95, 96, or 97, I have not said yet, one of those three percentages of the film, uh, the film's dialogue is not spoken, it's sung. So, people have a problem with that. I, I particularly think it's an interesting choice. Well, number one, it's an interesting choice, and number two, it's like an interesting, uh, project, you know, just to see, okay, well, what happens if we do this? Now, as far as I know, in the stage play or the Broadway show or whatever, I do not know if it's the exact same that way or not, but um, it almost felt like an opera, and that might, you know, that might maybe work better in this case, but, it, but uh, there were some parts where I'm just like, okay, did they really have to make the song 30 seconds just because a couple of lines had to be sung, they have to give it a whole title? But, and of course there were some songs, of course, that were songs, you know, they were actually sung by either one person or a few people, like I Dream a Dream, or the Russell Crowe one I mentioned earlier, or a lot of Jean Valjean's uh, pieces are, you know, actual like three, four minute songs, and that's great. I love those. And the writing, of course, the music itself by, I, I can never, I don't even know the person who wrote this originally for Broadway, uh, for the stage, the music is fantastic. I love the lyrics are great. the The music itself is great. Everything about it just flows, and I like that. And that overall, the quality of that is enough to make it flow. I saw a film called Rock of Ages this year, and I just don't think it's a show that works even on Broadway with great directors, great stars. You don't get the feeling that it's a necessary, you know, production, or you don't feel that it's a great show overall. This, this is a good show. I, I wouldn't mind seeing this on Broadway now, or seeing it just somewhere, just to, to compare it, you know, because I'm sure there's differences. I'm sure there's people who like the stage better version, and then there might be people who like the movie version better, because they don't have to pay, you know, 50 bucks. They only pay 20 bucks to buy it on DVD, so that's them. And I might be with them there to save money, but, but yeah. Um, let's see, I'm not sure where else to go. I think I've covered just about everything that I wanted to. Um... Let's see, if I think about it really hard, maybe I'll think about a couple of things, but boy, I have to say, the film was entertaining from beginning to end. Oh, the length, that's what I was going to talk about. The length of the movie is another thing that people complain about. I personally feel that a movie, and it's a great quote, uh, I think from Siskel and Ebert, they quote somebody else saying it, but a film, and a film, a scene should never go on as long without, you know, making it too obvious that the scene is too long. There were a couple of moments here in this film where I thought maybe the scene went on too long. But that's just me. You might disagree with that completely. But I thought the film could have been cut down a little bit. Not a whole lot. The original song they had uh, was called Suddenly, I think. And the only reason I know that one by name is because I saw the Oscar noms live the other day. But yeah, uh, boy, I was, um, I was almost saying to myself, you know, kicking myself, saying, okay, well, that's a cheap way to get an Oscar. Uh, and as far as I know, it's actually the only competition is Skyfall, which, yoo-hoo for Skyfall. Yeah, we'll get to that here in my next video, but you don't have to watch that if you just want to watch Les Mis. Okay, out of ten, this film gets eight. It's great, uh, and it's entertaining while you're watching it. But afterwards, you find a few problems with it that are consistent, even if they don't exactly cripple the film entirely. Um, not to say that the film was never truly boring, nor was it completely uh, pointless. There was always something going on that kept me in my seat. I didn't have to go up and go to the bathroom, um, but nor did I was nor was I forced to tears. Which it was close on the Anne Hathaway part, though, because that was that was a true, you know, honest to God you know, actual performance that you get into character and you 
don't leave it. And I love performances like those. Those are the performances that sometimes Oscar ignores or sometimes Oscar misses. They nominated her, she better win. But I have heard that Sally Field is good competition for Lincoln, so... So, uh, yeah, and I'm gonna tell you that tomorrow, then, what I think about Lincoln once I see that. But yeah, I think the film is great. Uh, if you're a fan of musicals, you'll love it. If you're a fan of the show, you'll love it. If you like movies at all, you'll be interested in it, at least, uh, even if you think it's too long. Uh, two hours and 37, 38, 39 minutes, whatever. It's still a long movie, but I think you'll like it. Uh, and that's just me. So, do my crap here and say sign off. And, hopefully you'll be watching my reviews, and I'll be watching out for you guys.